So with this, with this, I would like to move on next to what I had to present. Um, what I would like to do is at the next step is talk a little bit about how the analysis is constructed. So it's important to understand construction of the analysis in order to understand how to extract the data from a paper in a systematic review. So let me just see, let me just summarize where we are before I get to that step. So maybe this is revision, but I believe this is important revision. So you can see here that uh, the steps are frame the question, search the literature, when the papers are identified, extract the data. In order to understand what data need to be extracted, we need to understand how analysis should be constructed to address our question. So first, let's look at a very simple analysis. We are now, in order to understand this, we are now talking about a randomized trial. We'll show you an example of that trial in just one second. But I'm presenting you a measure of effect called odds ratio. The odds ratio is an estimate measured by this blob in green color. And then whatever we measure has an uncertainty in the measurement, and that is represented by this line, and we call it confidence interval. And we can use this type of a diagram called forest plot. Um, the value one represents that the likelihood or the odds of the outcome are no different between control group and intervention group. But if this blob and confidence interval is a lot on this side, we say that the odds of the outcome are increased in the intervention group. If this blob and the confidence interval are a lot on say that they are increased in the control group. And we are talking about an outcome that is bad, for example, death or poor quality of life or some kind of morbidity. Uh, if the outcome is positive, for example, becoming pregnant, then the direction could be in the opposite way that I just described. So for an outcome that is negative, like death, a value less than one of odds ratio will represent a benefit in favor of intervention. So in this type of situation, we will say this study shows that the intervention is effective. And we will say this intervention is so effective that the confidence interval does not cross the value one. So we are certain that this study shows that this intervention is effective beyond the play of chance. In other words, this result is also statistically significant. And in another situation, we will say, well, this intervention is harmful, the placebo is better, it actually kills more people if the outcome is mortality, because the odds ratio and all of the confidence interval is on this side of the line one. Does this make sense? Uh, I'm very happy to clarify any uncertainty about this idea that I've just described. I'm just going to bring the chat back on so I can see what your comments are. Um, I would like to ask if I can, yes. 
yes, in please. this type of um, of plot of forest plot is the event always negative of or we can have also forest plot inverted when we are looking to a positive event for example uh, um, i don't know clearance of a virus from our system or something like that would be a positive event so the plot would be um directed in the opposite direction right that's correct so i take another example which to me is a very very clear example of a positive event which is becoming for example yes uh, for an getting... infertile patient or being alive for a patient with cancer after many years but sadly our research is constructed by people before us in such a way that they always tend to convert this type of positive event on its head and say that we don't want to measure the number of people who are alive we want to measure the number of people who are dead uh, so most of the time this type of a plot is presented in the way i have presented it here but you are quite right if we turn the outcome on its head and say clearance of virus or presence of pregnancy or presence of being alive not dead then we can just turn this around from being favors intervention onto this side and controls and favors control to this side it's entirely in your own hands as a researcher to determine how you construct this type of graph does that make sense okay. yes of course thank you okay. so for the purpose of my presentation in this graph the outcome is a negative event like death or perinatal mortality or absence of survival in a cohort of people with cancer And then, Mirella, your question is, is this horizontal line? You mean by horizontal, you mean this line? No, uh, where you have uh, those circles, okay? Like, um, uh, I'm uh, just thinking the length of, uh, because we find it uh, usually in investigations. Yes, this line, yeah. You see, the, yes, the, uh, you have three horizontal lines, okay, on your uh, yeah, you mean this ratios. Line. Yes. This, this, this line, yes. okay. The this this line across the blob. Yes. Okay, so this line measures the confidence interval. It is called the confidence interval. Guess what? How long is this line depends almost entirely on the sample size. If you study 10,000 patients and the outcome is reasonably common, then this line could be so small that it could be entirely inside this blob. It could be just so small that it's just there. If you only study 10 patients, the line could be so long that it may not even fit inside this slide. So what I want you to think about this line is that this line is simply a function of the sample size. This is a very, very simple way of describing it. There is more to say about this, which we'll talk later on than sample size alone. But sample size is one of the key determinant in most studies of the length of this line. Make sense? Mirella? Much, thank you. All right. So I now give you a question. You can see that the length of this line is roughly the same as the length of this line, right? But the results are in the opposite direction. This one shows that treatment is better.
it is very likely that these two studies have roughly the same sample size. What about this study? The length of the line is smaller in this study than the length of the line in this or that study. Is that correct? You can see that. And the size of the blob I have drawn is bigger than this blob or this blob. So frequently when we draw this type of a diagram in a meta-analysis, we try to capture the size of the study by the length of this line and the size of this blob. So now you have studied several features of this type of a diagram. One of the features is that depending on how you define the outcome, where this blob and line is can tell you whether the intervention is effective or not. And secondly, you can have a good idea about the size of the study or the relative size of the study amongst the studies included in this type of a diagram. Okay, keep this idea in your head. Now we would like, I would like to move on to how we calculate odds ratio and what are odds. In order to do this, I'll move on to a diagram like this. And please remind me to come back to the previous diagram in, in a second. So whenever you are extracting data for any type of systematic review, you should try to understand for your question, what type of analyses are possible. And then from that, you can figure out what type of data you will need to extract papers. So we've talked about the fact that in any study, there is a typical flow from participants to interventions to outcomes. And then in this case, you will use all of the data collected to calculate the effect size. So if in a study there are 200 people, they are being followed up, 100 in each group. In order to simplify for the purpose of today's topic, which is randomized trials, let's say that the intervention has been randomly allocated to these 200 people, so about 100 people are in each group you will know that in real life it would be very hard to do a study without any patient or data loss so when you construct your data extraction strategy think about collecting data concerning at what stage how many patients were lost could be that patients were lost before randomization lost after randomization could be that the patients were lost after the intervention and the control were allocated could also be that the data were lost after uh, the data about outcome had been collected because something went wrong in your data collection system and with all of this information, you are then also able to calculate the effect size. So we are going to take a hypothetical study where a group of 200 infertile couples in a hypothetical study where there are no data losses were followed up and under intervention, 25 became pregnant and under control, 10 became pregnant. And from this data, we will calculate in a very simple way the effect size. So the first thing for construction of an effect size is the construction of what we call a two by two table.
the table on the top has outcomes and on the side has intervention or control. So now can you see that construction of your research question is really critical. If you do not know what is the outcome and what is the intervention and control, you may construct the two by two table in the wrong way around. Can you see that? If you end up putting intervention here and control here and outcome present and outcome absent over here, maybe you will not get the right statistical calculation. The people who became pregnant in the intervention group need to be put over there. The total need to go over here. And those who became pregnant need to go over there and the control over there. So can you now begin to see the relationship between the construction of your research question, the importance of it to the construction of the two by two table, and then putting the information concerning outcome intervention or exposure present or ex exposure absent in the correct order. And then you have some likelihood of constructing your analysis correctly. Here we have the table from this hypothetical study we are talking about. You can also see that when we talk about participants, this information is contained over here. The total of the two group presented somewhere around here as 200 is your participants. So we talked earlier about odds ratio, but you also are familiar with a term called relative risk. We'll calculate the relative risk first because it's simpler to understand. The risk is a proportion. So what is the risk of becoming pregnant or the chance of becoming pregnant in the intervention group? Well, it's 25 divided by 100, which is 0 0.25. The chance of becoming pregnant in the control group is 10 divided by 100, which is 0.1. And the relative risk is one divided by the other. And then we get that over here, and it's 2.5. Odds ratio, it is not risk or chance or probability or proportion. It's odds that is important in the calculation of odds ratio. So what is odds? For the calculation of odds, we need a different piece of information, which is over here. We divide the number of people pregnant divided by the number of people who are not pregnant in the intervention group. And the odds of the control is the number of people in the control group who become pregnant divided by the number who did not become pregnant in the control group. And you can see what the odds are. And when you divide one by the other, you get odds. Ratio. And you get three. You can also see here that the value three is a number greater than the value 2.5. So you can see that depending on the analysis you apply, given the same data set, you can get different results or different effect sizes. Okay, I'm going to stop here and let you ask me any questions concerning construction of effect size based on the two examples I've given you.
How do you define effect size? That's a good question. So I've given you examples of two effect sizes. One is called relative risk, and the other one is called odds ratio. Okay, uh, so relative risk and odds ratio are two uh, examples of effect size. And the value of the result is the size. The name of the measure is the effect. Okay. Yeah, so the effect size using the effect measure relative risk is 2.5. The effect size using the effect measure odds ratio is 3.0. Okay, thank you. The effect measure odds ratio is calculated by using the odds per group. The effect measure relative risk is calculated by using the measure of risk per group. Very happy for you to. I, I know that I have covered a lot very quickly. So I'd just like you to take your time to think through what we have been through. Because once you can understand what we have been through, it will become very easy for you to extract data for your systematic reviews. May I ask something? Of course, please go ahead. Um, if uh, we are we are doing a systematic review, yeah, and we find uh, several uh, literature articles uh, with a similar, but uh, at the same time also different outcomes. Uh, for example, uh, a couple of articles uh, uh, defines outcomes with uh, relative risk. Uh, another set of articles defines odds odds ratio. And let's say we also have some articles with hazard ratio. Uh, mm -hmm. And if uh, in the systematic review, uh, we would like to, uh, of course, cover all of uh, existing uh, literature data. Yeah. Is there any way that we could uh, join uh, all of these outcomes in uh, under the same meta analysis? Yes, OK. So that's a good point. So the first thing to remember is that when you are going to be a systematic reviewer, you are not a slave of the author who wrote the original paper that you have selected for your review. You are an independent researcher who has his own independent mind and his own independent way of thinking about his or her research question. So it does not matter what the original author reported, whether they reported relative risk or odds ratio or hazard ratio or mean difference or something else. As, as you can by reading the tables and the data provided, construct the two by two table mm -hmm. for the purpose of your own systematic review, you can perform your own analysis. Mm -hmm. So we can recalculate uh, whatever we want as long as we have available data. Yeah. That is the whole idea behind being an independent systematic reviewer with your own mind. Mm -hmm. Look, okay. this is very, very important to understand. Mm -hmm. Authors make mistakes. Editors make mistakes. Peer reviewers make mistakes. Almost all the papers that you will ever read in your life will have mistakes in them. And they will not have been constructed or analyzed in a way 
that you feel is the right way for your analysis and approach to a research question. So mm -hmm. when you are a systematic reviewer, you are an independent researcher. Okay, so you I would be chained, able to... You mm -hmm. are not chained to the story of what was published in a few years ago in a different journal. Okay, I understand. Thank you. So I would be able uh, to use all articles which uh, enable me uh, to obtain the figures that I'm interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. thanks. If you cannot obtain those figures that you need, you can just write an email to the author and ask them to respond. If they don't respond, you can write them a second email. If they don't respond, at the time when you submit your manuscript of the systematic review for publication, you can state in your methods and results that you approached the author for data and they were unable to respond. So you were as a result able to or not able to perform the analysis that you wanted. Okay, I think some while I was addressing this point, some some comments may have appeared in ah, there, 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 there isn't any more comment so far. Very happy to take more comment or question. Please uh, feel free even to ask about how we got here. I think someone attempted to unmute their mic. I'm, I'm patient and happy to take any more questions at this stage. Okay, look, we have uh, about 45 minutes left in today's time of work available to us. I'm going to briefly now take you to the next stage in data extraction. But before that, I'd like to cover one element really important concerning literature search. So for the purpose of orientation, I'd just like to remind you one more time where we are. And I'd like to take you back to this slide that we have seen before. So you have framed a question. You have searched the literature. You have identified the studies. And you have now also extracted some data from them. From this data, you are able to calculate the effect size for the studies that you have collected. I think yesterday colleagues asked me whether there is a risk that we need to search that some some colleagues pointed out that it was a lot of effort to search many different databases. And I said, yes, it is a lot of effort. And then I think nobody said, but I point out to you that there is also a risk that there may have been studies conducted that we cannot capture in our search. So it's an important question for any systematic reviewer to worry about. In my systematic review, will I have any missing studies? So one of the ways to avoid missing studies is to search as many databases as you can. But another way to try to figure out if you have any missing studies is to examine the data you have extracted in order to see whether there is a risk of missing studies. So we now want to look at how this can be achieved. So assessing the risk of missing studies is also 
called something like examining the risk of publication bias. This type of a bias usually arises due to small study effects. It arises when publications of studies are linked to the significance of their findings, regardless of the quality of the study. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. In the slide I showed you a moment ago. In these two studies, which study is more likely to be missed? The bad one, the negative one. This one. The one on the right hand side, okay, that's a good point. Alex says, yes, the one on the right hand side. Okay, if the right hand side study was missing, Do you think there could be a problem in our systematic review? Yeah, Jaka is correct. The one missing control is more missing. Yes, we could have a big problem in that we may, by mistake, begin to conclude that this intervention is effective because we could not capture this study. So it is very important to try to figure out that we have not missing studies. So the way to do that is to calculate these effect sizes that we talked about and then to think about whether there is a relationship between effect size relationship between the effect size and the size of the study Remember, I mentioned to you that the length of the confidence interval is related to the size of the study. And typically, we say that when the study is too small, it can have type 2 error. Type 2 error is the chance of not having a significant finding when the study is small. So in a typical meta-analysis, there does not have missing studies. The small studies will be spread all over the place because by chance they could have a large effect size or by chance they could have a small effect size compared to the large good quality studies in this matter in, 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 in the same topic. And this type of a distribution of studies inside a meta-analysis is called a plot, a, a funnel plot, and the funnel is said to be symmetrical. But you can also have studies where small studies in one side of the plot are missing. This type of a plot is called an asymmetrical funnel plot. And this type of a plot arises because The journals are more interested in publishing a particular type of result on a particular topic. So in this case, the studies on this side of the, of the funnel plot appear to be missing inside this funnel. Can you see that clearly? Does anybody have any comment to make on what I've just shown? Okay, Jaka says it's clear. Thank you. Other people haven't said anything, but, but perhaps. Okay, to Polona, it's also clear. Catherine, also clear. Thank you. Well, these are the missing studies, and the, actually now I give you a big secret. Well, it should no longer be a secret to you. This idea that small studies by chance have type 2 error and cannot produce significant results is only imagined by 
people who have written textbooks without engaging in research themselves. Because you can see that because publication bias exists, there is a good chance that small studies will exist in the literature that will more likely, because of cherry picking of results and using unrepresentative sample, will give extreme results. And as a result of the extreme results, this frequently stated textbook statement that small sample sizes lead to type 2 error will in fact prove wrong in real research practice. Give you an example. This is a, a published study concerning infertility. It concludes that anti-estrogen therapy improves pregnancy rates. This is the published meta-analysis. This is the funnel plot of the data. And even though the data shows even to a blind person that there are missing studies, no comment is made in this meta-analysis concerning missing studies. If you have attended this course, you will be able to see that you will not agree with the conclusion reported in this published systematic review. Any, 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 anybody wishes to make any comment on what I just said? Well, there are no comments, but I hope you will, through this process, start to begin to be confident that when you read papers, you don't just accept what is published in the abstract or what's published in the conclusions in the discussion. You will be able to make your own interpretation of what you observe. And this is what systematic review and becoming a systematic reviewer is about. You can generate your own opinion about data pre published based on a proper evaluation of what you read in the published paper. So this is taking you to the next step in data extraction. We're now going to move on to what is the best way to do data extraction? Well, you should do it in duplicate. You should use some statistic to see if two people extract the data from a paper you come up with the same result and then you can also report the characteristics of the studies in a study characteristics tables but then you need to report the quality of the study so here i like to remind you that there are efforts in of all different kinds in published papers as a systematic reviewer your role is to pick up those errors and yesterday, somebody said to me, can I comment about study designs? And here I'm going to make some comments about study designs in the context of study quality. So study quality is the Achilles heel of good research. The study quality refers to the validity or freeness from bias of a published study. The typical idea is that a randomized trial is less subject to bias than cohort study and it's less subject to bias than a case control study uh, i'd like to highlight very much here to the colleague who is going to use machine learning that machine learning does not make your data or study free of bias the method you employ to collect the data is what makes your study free of bias so if your data are if the source of your data are a case control design no matter how fancy your machine learning model will be the underlying sources of bias cannot be eliminated from this type of a design by using fancy statistics the power now i am not talking about statistical power I'm talking about the power of trustworthiness of a study 
lies in the method or design employed for collecting data. And in the context of effectiveness research, randomized trial is uh, considered more trustworthy than the cohort study. And a cohort study is considered more trustworthy than a case control study. Collecting the data concerning quality in data extraction in a systematic reviews will allow you to use this information to include this inside tables, inside figures, but also to more analytically employ uh, your assessment of the data uh, in order to make more robust inferences, which you can then not include in your discussion section. So we return back to this uh, hierarchy of designs. I'm going, to, I'm going to just pause here for a moment and see if colleagues have any questions concerning study design for me. Okay, well, I, I hope I have encouraged you to think, even if I haven't managed to encourage you to ask me any questions. Uh, I remind you again of uh, some things I said yesterday um, about basic laboratory research being applied research and patient-centered research uh, being, uh, sorry, uh, basic laboratory research being uh, research concerning uh, development of scientific knowledge and the research from patients, the data collected from patients uh, being research that is applied research. So you can see that basic laboratory research can or lab, cannot directly be applied to patients. And that is the reason why it normally ranks lower down in this hierarchy of evidence. Okay, we now come to randomized control trial and how you can assess whether a randomized control trial is a good quality trial. So when you conduct a randomized trial, we have the same idea. Sample allocated to two groups by randomization. Following randomization, people are followed up to see whether they have outcome or not. And when we have these data available, we can calculate the effect size. And you will know from what I said before that if the sample size is quite large, the confidence interval of the effect size could be quite narrow. So we, we immediately can solve the problem of confidence interval by recruiting a lot of patients. But whether this effect size will be trustworthy depends on other features. Those features are, well, one of those features is where the sample size is representative. This, this specific aspect refers to something called generalizability. We will not be talking about this today. We'll talk about this another day. So uh, I flag this up for you, but then I take this away from consideration. We now return to the idea of bias or internal validity or, or something that I call quality. And we refer to these things called selection bias, performance bias, and measurement bias. 
And a randomized trial can have selection bias because randomization has not been conducted properly. It can have performance bias because blinding has not been conducted properly. It can have measurement bias because outcome measurement has not been blinded properly. And it can also have something called attrition bias because follow-up of patients have not been complete. So you can see that a randomized trial needs to have all of these things done right in order for it to be free of bias. So if it is not free of bias with respect to blinding during the course of the study, then in the example of acupuncture studies, an empirical evaluation shows that in non-blinded randomized trial, the effect looks far better than the control compared to blinded trials, where the effect looks much closer to control. Okay, so blinding in randomization is important because it creates groups balanced at baseline. A cohort study normally suffers in this area of selection bias. In terms of blinding related to follow-up after randomization, here the groups are balanced in respect to co-intervention after randomization. This is called performance bias. And we already referred to measurement of outcome. For example, even if a patient is, even if the outcome is something like death, there could be bias in its measurement if the patient is on a ventilator. Because the criteria for how we define death for a ventilated patient could vary from one intensive care specialist to another intensive care specialist. And then attrition why we already looked at it earlier when we talked about how we calculate effect size and I said it was very important to determine whether there were missing patients or missing data. So the quality of a randomized trial can be assessed in this way, looking at selection bias, by presence or absence of double blinding, by looking at performance bias and measurement bias by looking at attrition bias, by examining whether people dropped out or didn't. And when we have this information available, we can say whether a study included in a systematic review is of high or low quality. So can you see now how important it is to report the quality of studies, including in your systematic review, even when they are randomized control trials, because within randomized control trials, there is a possibility of high or low quality trials, depending on whether or not they have attrition bias or measurement bias or performance bias, or risk of selection bias due to flaws in methods used for randomization. So the consort statement, remember we talked yesterday about PRISMA statement required for reporting systematic reviews for randomized trials. The statement required for reporting is called consort and consort requires you to report inside a published trial features concerning outcomes and allocation of random allocation method for randomization, etc. So in a properly reported trial, you should be able to capture this information and create this type of a table. I just noticed a question in the chat which says, what was the plus and minus in column four? 
Okay, so in a scoring system for quality assessment called Haddad scoring system, you can allocate a score of plus one or zero or minus one to a trial according to whether or not it properly randomized or had double blinding or had completeness of follow-up. And with this type of a score, you can achieve a score from zero to five. So this study that has scored a maximum of five, we call it a high quality study, but any score up to three is called a low quality study. I hope that answer your question. And there are other methods of quality assessment available. When you plan your systematic review, you can decide which type of quality assessment method you will apply in your systematic review. Okay, so to summarize, we just we just go back for a moment to a randomized trial. We said a moment ago that if you conduct a randomized trial, you are expected to report the randomized trial according to consort, which allows for systematic reviewers to capture information concerning biasing factors as to how randomization was implemented, how blinding was implemented, and how outcome measures were uh, implemented. But if you are using, if you are conducting a randomized trial, just like I said yesterday, that systematic reviews should be prospectively registered, randomized trials are also expected to be prospectively registered. And uh, a prospective registration site would require you to register a trial and using your protocol, you can publish your trial and the guideline or reporting method for writing up the manuscript of a randomized trial is, is called a spirit guideline. So if you're doing a systematic review of a randomized trial, not only the published trial is a source of information for assessment of quality of a trial, but also its prospective registration document is source of information and its published protocol, if the protocol has been published. So you have three or four sources of information from which to extract data concerning a trial included in your systematic review. In the meantime, I noticed a question coming up. Before ending the lecture, can I show you Again, the flow chart concerning levels of evidence, of course. In fact, I'm going to show you that just now. It's a good, it's, it's, it's a time to ask that, it's a right time to ask that question. Go back to that flow chart. Here it is. We talked in more detail in the last 15 minutes about randomized control trials. The randomized control trials themselves can be high or low quality. And low quality randomized trials could be very close to observational studies in terms of trustworthiness. And observational studies of high quality can be very close to randomized trials in terms of trustworthiness. I believe this lecture is being recorded, so I believe the recording will be available to you. And I will be very happy to share a PDF file of all my slides without any problems. 
And for colleagues who asked me yesterday about my systematic review book, everything I said today about quality assessment concerning the details of assessment of a randomized trial are all available within that systematic review. And in addition, there are several examples included in the book that explain also how to measure quality of observational studies, including observational studies of cohort design and case control design. So Sarah, you asked about uh, whether I can show you the flow chart for assessing levels of evidence. I would be grateful if you could let me know whether you have any questions. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, thank you. It's okay. Just wanted to review it because I think it's a very useful uh, flow chart. Well, look, I'm going to say also to you that this flow chart is not set in stone. You can feel free to construct your own versions of this in line with, uh, with with better, greater understanding of how quality is assessed. For example, you can see that 2B has put together low quality RCTs with um, cohort studies of higher quality. You can probably also notice from this flowchart that when I said to you yesterday, a randomized trial is a type of a cohort study, that, sh that you can make the link between that concept from the slide yesterday and this chart. And what is an ecological study? Uh, an ecological study is a study where the outcomes and exposures are not measured in the same patients. So, for example, um, ecological exposure could be the pollution levels in a city measured by pollution measures devices placed by the environmental agency of the city. And the outcomes could be the level of malformations amongst pregnancies in that city. So you can see that the outcome malformations is measured in pregnant women but their exposure to pollution was not measured directly by taking their blood samples can you, can you see what i mean now yes yeah, so it's, of exposure it's a... was separated from the source of measurement of outcome Okay, so it's a kind of observation, observational study. That's correct. It's a type of observational study. That's correct. Okay, thank you.